Good afternoon, everybody. It's a privilege and a joy to be here with all you men. Um, I guess I'll just quickly pray. Uh, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this conference. We thank you for your word that gives, uh, gives light to our lives and helps us to uh, understand the calling that you've placed on us as men. I thank you for uh, what we've heard today, and I pray that uh, you would guide me as I speak here, uh, that it would be your words and not mine. And I just pray that, uh, that it would be a blessing to these men. Thank you for each one here. In Jesus' name. All right. Have you ever heard of the saying, order out of chaos? It's a common saying that has been repeated by many over the past few decades. The basic idea is to have order, we must first have chaos. And then through concerted effort, we have order. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says, For God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. The word translated as confusion can also be translated as disorder or riots. Peace is not merely freedom from war, but can be described as harmony, as a state of security and safety. Romans 14, 17 to 19 expands on this idea of order and peace. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. And this is the important part. So, let us, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual up- upbuilding. We must redirect our focus away from the things that will pass away towards the eternal things. Another way we could say this is we must work towards order rather than chaos. The world tells us that the chaos is necessary, but it's absolutely not. Uh, Next, we will look at some of the truths found in the biblical account of creation. Um, So God creates and he separates. He makes light from darkness, land from sea, male from female everything necessary, the perfect environment for man. He makes man in the image of God after his likeness, and we are a shadow or a resemblance or a reflection of our creator, as Pastor Aaron was speaking about earlier. So God's creation before the fall, it was very all very good. It was orderly. It was peaceful. So man was given three basic responsibilities, if we want to sum them up. We are called to provide, that's to be productive, to, that our environment would produce fruit. We are to protect, we are to guard or watch over, which means we must be able to recognize a threat. We must be vigilant, we must be strong. We are called to lead or teach, lead and teach. And to do this, we have to be knowledgeable, wise. We must be an example. And uh, important, whether we succeed or fail at these duties, we cannot escape being an example. We will either be a good or a bad example. So, Pastor Aaron did a great job of talking about this earlier. So I'm just going to really quickly cover this to contrast what's important. When we have our eyes fixed on God in the right place, when we're vertical and we're seeking to serve him first. Everything falls into place. We get order. But when we start looking and fixing our gaze out at the created things or at self, um, a misplaced, a misplaced focus, um, we end up, we end up with a, a lot of disorder. So the good news is that God sends his son, the new and the better Adam, to accomplish what, he, what, we, what Adam couldn't. He reordered and reconciled all things to himself. The end result of God's work is a glorious city comprised of not two, but a multitude of image bearers redeemed by their creator. They will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. And that's out of Revelation 21. So the question lies, how, do you, how, will, how will you build 
How will you build your household? How will you build in your church? According to the earthly tendencies that we heard, to Adam's tendencies, or according to the ways of Christ? So the main idea here is to lead well, we must reorder every area of our lives after the example of Christ, teaching and encouraging others around us to do the same. The evidence of a well-ordered life is peace. So first we have to get wisdom. You can have knowledge without being wise. There's plenty of people who have that, but you can't be wise without knowledge. Wisdom is the application of that knowledge to discern what is right and true, or in other words, to apply sound judgment. When Solomon asked the Lord for wisdom, he did so in humility. He said, I am a little child. He acknowledged just how little he knew and just how inadequate he was to govern God's people. He said, I don't know how to come in or how to go out. The first step is to recognize that you need wisdom. It says in Proverbs 4, 7, beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. And whatever you get, get insight. The next passage contra contrasts two kinds of wisdom, the earthly with that from above. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Wisdom is faith in action. There's no room for boasting. It's not based in self-interest. Earthly wisdom looks good to the eye, but it leads to disorder and sin. 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but from the world. Godly wisdom is pure and leads to peace. We must sow or plant seeds in peace or apply God, God's godly wisdom in order to reap a plentiful harvest. We must be discerning so, we get, so that we can identify proper wisdom by its fruit. So look for wisdom in the right places. So what does wisdom and disciple making look like in the home? Proverbs 24, verses 3 to 6. By wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. A wise man is full of strength and a man of knowledge enhances his might. For by wise guidance, you can wage your war, and in an abundance of counselors, there is victory. So to establish an orderly household, wisdom is as vital as a blueprint is required to build a house. No one wages a war alone. As we've heard earlier, we need like-minded brothers around us to guide us and accompany us along the way. Good luck winning your battles if you fight alone. Next, we spoke about Ephesians 5. It's a tall order. But I want to focus in this part with wisdom on having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. And with 1 Peter 3, 7, to live toward your wives with an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. So we must prioritize our wives over ourselves and love them as servant leaders. So to lead her well, Encourage her to get the right kind of wisdom. Provide opportunities for her to grow and be discipled. Engage in spiritual conversation. Expand your own theological knowledge so that you can lead her better. If you lack wisdom, which I think we all do, we ask God in faith, that's James 1.5, and then search for it as for hidden treasure, Proverbs 2.4. Guard your home from bad theology that may be entering it and learn to recognize it. Protect them, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually and delight in them and show them honor. So with children, we have Deuteronomy 6, 
6 to 9 that Adam covered earlier this morning. And we also have Malachi 4, 6. I think this gets to the heart of being a father. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. We are to delight in them. We're to talk with them about the things of God and all that we do. That means we have to provide them with quality, meaningful time. So provide them with a Christian education. Give them Bibles. Keep an eye, protect them. Keep an eye on what they're watching, what they're listening to, and who they are influenced by. Watch for lies that they might be believing and lead them to the truth. Spend time talking about the things of God, reading scripture with them, praying with them, modeling those, disciple, those, di- those disciplines. Listen to worship music. Praise God in everything you do. Now in the church, 1 Peter 2.5 says that we as believers are living stones being built up into a spiritual house. We know that Christ loves his church dearly, dearly and gave himself up for her. So prioritize the church, the spiritual household. Commit to and get involved in building the church rather than being critical of it. Again, the importance of surrounding yourself with godly men. Proverbs 13, 20 says, He who walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm. Give of your time and speak wisdom into the lives of others. Teach and urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Come alongside them and help them lead their families. That was Titus 2.6, by the way. So next we have my second point. Take initiative. Again, this was a common theme through this uh, conference today. Um, Get going. If you're not moving, get going. 1 Corinthians 7.17 Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. We are all united in a a common mission, the Great Commission. But God has placed us all in our own unique circumstances. He's given us unique gifts and abilities, and our individual missions may vary. This is where prayer, wisdom, and discernment comes in. You need to figure out what the unique element is, where God desires for you to go. Being a godly leader involves initiative. You must take the first step. You will never build or or rebuild if you don't lay the first brick. I have a little bit of a personal part here, a personal story. As uh, Pastor Chris mentioned, I've I've been a believer in Christ for almost 20 years. Um, For the majority of that time, I took my family to church. I prayed before meals. I read my Bible Fairly faithfully, I served in the church. But everything looked decent. But in early 2020, when the the crisis showed up, the Lord showed me that I had not been nearly as fruitful as I should have been. My interests and my affections were divided. I loved the world. I loved my comforts much more than I should have. And I hadn't done a good enough job leading my family. I knew that the world around me was changing and the brand of Christianity that I had put on display for my family, I knew it would crumble under opposition to the Christian, under the, under the opposition to Christian values that I perceived was coming. So I repented of my passivity and my stubborn patterns of sin and I re- resolved to begin leading my family differently wholeheartedly committed to living biblically. I decided to take it one step at a time, a day at a time, a brick at a time. My wife and children noticed the difference fairly quickly. And uh, to my uh, praise God, it was, uh, they responded um, and it was uh, tangible. We started to see God working differently in our lives. It's, Not perfect, there's still thorns and thistles that come up, but I have no intention of ever looking back. So what I'm trying to say is, we could say I did a good job. I kept them fed, kept them watered, I entertained them. I took her out to dinner, I went to church. 
But there's a massive difference between doing something just to check off a box or if you're doing something with purpose. I'll illustrate my point by comparing Saul with Paul. Who in the flesh had more to boast than about than Saul? He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. So although he could persuade many in his day that he was doing good, the reality was that he was persecuting Christ. It wasn't until Christ redirected him that he got his focus right, that he was on the right mission. That's when his, his actions started actually yielding fruit. Our mission is to focus first on the eternal, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Immediately after Jesus said this, he spoke of the eye as the lamp of the body. How if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. I say this again, pay close attention where you set your, eye, where you set your eyes. Ephesians 5.14 says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead. Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making best use of the time, because the days are evil. Our wives and our children have been entrusted to us, and they are made to live eternally. Let's make sure we are rendering them to God rather than to the world and to the culture. It's important that we get this right, because in case you haven't noticed, the enemy and the world are after them. So initiative, it's getting to action without prompting or direction from others. It is to act first. Through scripture, we see that God initiates. He initiated the created order by speaking it into existence. When Adam and Eve sinned, God sought them out and he called to them. God initiated every covenant we see in scripture. Noah, Abraham, King David, just to name a few. And he's the one who initiated our salvation. God acts first. So in your marriage, if you're married, she said yes, because you initiated. You asked her. You won her heart because she was persuaded that you were a man fit to love, lead, provide for, and protect her. Now it's important to avoid the trap of assuming that the job is done, that you got the girl. The goal is to build an orderly, peaceful, joyful household. A house must be built, but then it requires maintenance. Similarly, a garden requires upkeep. Those weeds and thorns will keep reappearing. In all things, but especially when we go wrong, we must be the ones to initiate in conversation, in prayer, repentance and restoration. We must care enough to act we must care enough to speak, as Pastor Aaron said. We must, to, must continue to pursue as Christ pursued us and sought us out. We accomplish th this by loving sacrificially, to give ourselves up, to prioritize her needs, to nourish and to cherish her. It's an ongoing process. So build your household in such a way to allow her to prioritize her duties in the home. This is not to say that you must bring in all the income. If you can't, Work towards that. Ask the Lord to guide you. Maybe you need to cut back on your lifestyle or your income, or, in, or increase your income, sorry. Um, pursue her regularly. Take her on a date. Show interest and thoughtfulness. Make sure the time that you spend with her is quality time. Be intentional, give her gifts. Gain physical and spiritual strength to initiate action against anything that might be a threat to your relationship or to your home. Initiate in the difficult conversations, the disagreements, the sin, the sin issues. Pastor Aaron covered that well. Initiate repentance and work towards restoration when you've done wrong. And lead the way in prayer. By the way, if it's awkward, it's because you haven't done it enough. So start. Um, so initiating with your children. Ephesians 6, 4. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So the previous three verses instruct children to obey their parents in the Lord. But we as fathers are to ensure that we aren't making it too great a burden to obey us or to follow us. Jesus said that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We should do the same. Proverbs 22.6, which was mentioned earlier, train up a child in the way he should go. 
So study your children, get to know them, pray for them, and that you will come to know the way that God has gifted them. That will help you and your sons and daughters to figure out the way they should go, their mission. Encourage them, especially your boys, to initiate by stepping out, by taking a risk, trying something new. The goal of discipline and instruction is not simply to get compliance. Compliance is what the world is obsessed with. This is what I do for a living. But it doesn't work because it's focused on works. True, cheerful obedience comes from the heart. So with your kids, focus on the heart. The goal is that they might come to love the law because they have come to love the lawgiver. They need to love the blueprint. They need to love God's design. Initiating with love and affection is a must. Proverbs 22, 15, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. We must not fail to discipline either and leave a child in his or her folly. We must initiate this process and do it in a godly way. We must confront sin. Discipline and punishment are not the same thing. Discipline has to do with leading, teaching, and restoration. And all this has to be done with affection. Punishment has to do with administering justice. It's a consequence for sin and for deterring further sin. Although there's a place for both, we want, to, we want them to fear the consequence. But the focus must lie in the teaching, the love, and the restoration aspect of it. God's word must be involved and obeyed in all of this. This includes us repenting to our children when we have failed to obey the Lord in our actions towards them. Now in church, you must initiate getting your family involved in the church. Where you see needs, meet them by using your gifts, your time, your talents, and your treasures. Encourage your family to serve as well. Help them identify, develop, and use their gifts. So as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength as God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. That was 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11 up on the screen. So if you're gifted for leadership in the church, you are to equip the saints. You are to disciple. You're to build up the body of Christ. If you don't know what your gifts are, make it a priority to find out. Pray about it. Ask some trusted brothers in Christ, your life group leader, a mentor, and then start using them. So now to my last point, be an example through perseverance. Again, Adam touched on this. It's to keep going. So it's a lifelong task. We don't know what lies ahead, but we know there'll be challenges, there'll be trials, there'll be temptations. The enemy will attack. There will be thorns and thistles, but we must be men who overcome as Christ overcame. He finished the job. He accomplished his mission. He did not shrink back from danger. He was, and he is the ultimate man. So run the race that you may obtain the prize. The worst thing we can do is give up. We have all messed up. We've all failed. Both Judas and Peter committed grievous sins that night that Jesus was arrested. But only one overcame by trusting and returning to Christ. Avoid trusting in your strength and avoid the opposite ditch of unbelief, of doubting that God will give you victory. Philippians 3.14, press on towards the goal. A good running back in football, when he hits the pile, he keeps his feet moving. There's a lot of wisdom in that. So who are we imitating? 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Christianity is an imitative faith. It is a part of how the creator designed us. And it's evident right from a little child. No matter what we do, we imitate or mimic somebody. Therefore, it's extremely important that the ones we mimic are actually a good example. Further, we must think of the ones that mimic us. Do you know that if a child is the first person in a household to become a Christian, there's a 3.5% probability that everyone in the house will follow. If it's the mother, it's 17%. 
But if it's the father, it's a 93% probability that everyone in the house will follow. That's a great statistic just to show how important the man's leadership is in his home. How we follow Christ will also have an effect on what our families imitate. Look at the patterns we see in our own lives. We must continue in the examples of our fathers and forefathers where they did well, but we must guard against our predisposition to follow in their errors as well as Adam's errors. These cycles can only be broken through a Holy Spirit led life. In the church, identify men who have a well-ordered life and imitate them in what they do well. Men who love the Lord, who have a strong marriage, who have godly children, who work hard, who steward well. Imitate what they do well and learn from what they don't do well. Figure out how did he get there and be so bold as to ask. So now in the home, Psalm 128, 1, 4. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. What a beautiful picture that is. Our family is blessed when we order our lives according to God's design. The result of this is a fruitful household, and this is what we need to be striving after. It starts with your wife. She's your first mission field. Your sons will learn how to treat women based on how you treat their mother. Similarly, your daughters will learn how a man treats his wife from your behavior. You must prioritize your wife, your wife and your relationship with her. Malachi 2 states that, did he not make them one? Uh, Malachi 2, 14 to 16. Did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. So Christ must continue to be Lord and the sustainer of our marriage. If you're both drawing near to Christ, the unity and the harmony, the peace in your marriage will increase. So let your approach to your marriage be characterized by faithfulness. Be truthful with her, unfailingly loyal and steadfast in your affection. The best defense is offense. Hold your marriage in honor and keep your marriage bed undefiled. Pastor Chris just spoke on that. Keep your sexual energy reserved for your wife. Delight in her. Cherish her and show her your actions more so when you aren't seeking intimacy, but also do when you are. If your marriage isn't healthy, don't ignore it and pretend that it, and don't ignore it and pretend that it is. Identify where you've gone wrong, acknowledge your sin, repent, take responsibility, and get to work. Get to work at rebuilding. Seek wise counsel or even biblical counseling if you need to. Just as Christ took responsibility for our sins, we need to take responsibility when things aren't going well. A coach doesn't generally play the game, but a good one takes responsibility for losses and for what goes wrong. He finds a way to get better. So now we get to the decision-making process. Always make your best efforts to come to a consensus with your wife on a decision. But on occasion, that doesn't happen. If you're making a decision she doesn't agree with, make sure you have approached it carefully and prayerfully. Then tell her you've done this and are prepared to give an account for it. With our children, we are the tone setters in our home. When we walk in the door, everyone notices. It has an effect on everyone there, for better or for worse. I know this from experience. <laughs> what effect are we having? One of joy, peace, hope, patience, kindness? or frustration, stress, irritability. Before you set foot in your house, check your heart. Prepare yourself and pray that you will reflect Christ towards your family. Watch your words. Proverbs 18, 21 states that death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruits. It is the basic tone of our speech 
Is the basic tone of our speech one that criticizes, tears down, or, and destroys, or one that builds up, encourages, and strengthens? As Christ said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Share with your kids some of the things you are thinking through. Talk to them about the cultural issues and the lies that they are being told. How to think, not what to think. You are training your children to become disciples who will make disciples, and you are preparing them to become husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, and future leaders in the church. Adam spoke about this earlier. Now in the church, Titus 1.5, Paul left Titus in Crete to appoint elders in every town. The church is the household of faith and the household of households. It is led by men who manage their households well, men who are wise, spirit-filled, sound in doctrine, able to teach, hospitable, lovers of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. These are qualities that we expect to find in a mature believer, in a faithful husband and father. And it was mentioned earlier, if, if you desire to lead well in the, in the church, and even if you don't, strive towards maturity in Christ, towards being a man who exemplifies these, char these characteristics. So now I've got a little exercise, um, a practical exercise, because we want to leave here with a tangible outcome. What are, we, what are we going to put feet to? What are we going to put into practice? So there's some handouts going around. And don't be afraid of the, it's five pages, but it's do one. Pick the one that is the most, that you're the most convicted about. Whatever God is, whatever the Holy Spirit is, is leading you to, uh, towards. The five categories are the overall state of your household, leadership in the home. Oops. Um, there's specific to marriage, children, and to the church. So pick one of the sheets when you get it and work through it. At the top, there's uh, some scripture references if you want to look. If you want to kind of move around and have a bit of privacy, um, go ahead and do that. Um, you can use the one to five score as to assess the fruit. So what we're looking at is Matthew 7, 15, a healthy tree bears good fruit and a diseased tree bears bad fruit. So the idea is that we're going to assess the fruit in our lives in these areas. And then we're going to identify what we need to surrender to Christ and what, what we need to move towards. Uh, Galatians 5, 9, 19 to 24 will give you bad fruit and good fruit, um, the fruit of the Spirit. And then we have a similar passage in 2 Peter 1, 5 to 8. So use those to help you do this task. Um, So again, the plan must have clear, achievable outcomes and goals with well-defined steps that you plan to take. Leave some room for stumbling, but don't stop moving forward. And make sure you have something that outlines how you will be held accountable. So maybe consider um, you know, sharing it with a trusted mentor, a life group leader, discipleship group leader. Um, but again, the goal is to start building in towards God's design. And while we do this task, I'm just going to give you a couple examples just to help you, uh, just to help you if uh, you're having any difficulty. So for overall state of the household, the example I have is you have the wrong mission. You fo the focus is on earthly things, on money, pleasure, the approval of man. There's no good fruit. You, your wife and kids look just like the world. So I've got five basic steps. Repent and commit to following Christ wholeheartedly. Confess your sins to your family and tell them what you are doing. Three, give up TV, social media, or video games or whatever it is. Do like a digital fast two weeks, and then redirect that time to daily prayer, scripture reading, 
and spending quality time with your wife and kids discussing the things of God. During that time, pray for wisdom and discernment to identify the next step. And then keep up the first one. Um, ask your life group leader, your mentor, or a trusted brother to check in with you once a week. For the second one, I've got another example. So passivity in spiritual leadership. You're rarely discussing matters of faith at home. You feel like you don't know enough. and You're not a good enough example to teach. There's a sample plan. Repent and pray. Ask God for wisdom in faith. Second step, get wisdom. Read one chapter from a wisdom book from the Bible every day. That's Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. Step three, choose one person in your household or all of them and for each day and discuss what you will read with them, what God has said and how to apply it. Again, once you get this habit down, prayerfully discern what the next one is. And again, you need accountability. Trusted brother, a life group leader, a mentor. Third example, this is for the marriage one. You've committed to changing 57 things. After you got all fired up from a men's conference, you go home and you tell her all the things that would, all the changes that you would be making immediately. And she completely rejects your great ideas. And she even opposes you. So the plan, don't do this. <laughs> but if you do, live towards her with understanding. Have a discussion, so this is step one. Have a discussion about what you have come to realize, the reason things need to change, how you will be changing your ways, and just keep it to a couple things. Two, ask for forgiveness where you have sinned and where you have failed. Three, take initiative and follow through. So the samples I had in this one I forgot to mention were to pray with her each day and to plan a great date once a month, one that you actually put effort into. Four, once you get this one down, discern what the next one in. One is move on to items three and four because it's going to take a while to get to 57. And finally, you need an accountability step. That one's kind of going to be similar. And the last example I have for you is uh, the example is you discipline your child for disobeying, but it goes terribly again. The behavior doesn't seem to change and you feel like giving up. So the plan is examine your approach through a biblical lens and identify where you went wrong. Get wisdom. Repent to your child if you've sinned. For example, you punished him or her out of frustration because you wanted the annoying behavior to stop without any teaching, without any restoration. Two, get wisdom. Commit to prayer and studying scripture regarding that topic of biblical discipline. Three, identify a godly brother who does it well. Ask him for advice. Four, continue to seek and pray till you have a clear understanding. When the next occasion comes, check the motives of your heart. Pray first before you engage in the discipline and then apply it. Remember affection, teaching, correction, restoration, and ask a godly brother to hold you accountable. That's step six. That's all I have. So I hope that you uh, can find at least that one or two things don't just stay in the same place, get going and keep going. Promise you, Christ will reward faithfulness. He always does.